I, that's when I changed specialties and I worked in um, Washington, D.C. with immigrants and homeless. And that's where I really got an education about what health is and, and, and how stress just devastates mm. health. If you have, don't know if you can pay your rent and, you know, your husband's an alcoholic, whatever the circumstances were, yeah. you were abused as a kid. Uh-huh. the discrimination uh, it it you know you you're, you're going to have a wealth of health problems and misery and that's what they had and then this is what this is what really really got me to see how when they those folks were in a situation where they for the first time had hope it was like the magic ingredient mm. Welcome to the Natural Health Matters Podcast, where it's all about maximizing your health potential so that you can look and feel your best at any age. I'm your host, David Sandstrom, naturopathic doctor and biblical health coach, and this is episode number 94. Today we have in the show, Dr. Donna Chaco. Dr. Donna is the founder of Serenity in Health, which promotes health in body, mind, and spirit based on a foundation of faith in Jesus Christ. Dr. Chaco practiced medicine for decades as a radiation oncologist and later as a family medicine doctor. She's the author of Pilgrimage, A Doctor's Healing Journey. Dr. Chaco, welcome to Natural Health Matters. Oh, I'm very, very, very happy to be here with you today, David. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I know that we're very like-minded. Yes. And you know, here, the Natural Nation understands that we maximize our health potential when we align our lives more fully with God's natural design for spirit, mind, and body. And there's a lot there. And I know you have, you were a medical, I guess you still are a medical doctor. Do you keep your medical license uh, current? No, I let my license go when I retired eight years ago, nine years ago. Okay. So what I do now right. is, is more, is not as a licensed physician any longer. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your story. How did you, how did you come to be practicing medicine in a traditional fashion for so long and then branch out into the holistic realm? I'd love to hear that story. Okay. Well, I always loved being a doctor and um, I, I did that for decades and I, I really was content with it, very happy with it. Um, I changed and my view of health changed is what happened. And it was a long, painful process. <laughs> but eventually, I really did come to understand that my own path to full abundant health had so much to do with my spiritual journey. And I, and I learned how much my crazy in control overactive mind was causing me misery and how it's hard to be really healthy when you have a really, really painful, crummy relationship ongoing. Mm -hmm. And just, um, so, you know, a combination of major events, one major event and several minor events just changed and broadened how I looked at health. And uh, I retired when I was um, 64. I had I had had some health issues, some major burnout, which was one of my events. <laughs> Okay. But I really wasn't ready to stop. You know, that's why um, I got my, I was by this time on, on an intentional self-healing recovery kind of plan. And I got myself pulled together. And um, that's when I founded Serenity and Health. And I, I just had this calling to share what I had learned about health of body, mind, and spirit. Because I saw too many, too much suffering, too, uh, too much avoidable suffering, you know, and I, I could just yeah. see the many ways people could help themselves to feel better. And that was my mission. And it was all very much faith uh, based by this time because of my own journey. Yeah, that's really good. How long ago was that, that you started Serenity in Health? Eight years ago. Eight so, years ago. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think there's a lot of people listening, maybe not the regular listeners of this show, but if someone's just checking in, they may be inclined to say, you know, uh, faith and health, uh, that sounds good, but you know, you're not going to pray your way out of cancer. Um, so why don't you talk to the natural nation or that listener a little bit about the connection between our faith and the, the peace that knowing God brings and how that's connected to our physical vitality. It's just, it's, it's the 
the basic of what I like to talk about. So I appreciate that question, David. Um, there are so many links between faith and health. And um, the first, and I think really the most uh, critical, because it was the most necessary for me, was uh, once one comes to a full acceptance that you believe in God and that that means something and that you must ask yourself what that means and that yeah. you're willing to surrender to that. Yes. Um, then, you, you know, you, you have to spend a little bit of time. See, my problem for years, and I, I really went through desperate times in my marriage, was that I never had time for God or me or anything. I never slowed down. So the first thing it has to do with um, just slowing down, giving God some time in your life, giving yourself some time, giving God some time, giving yourself the benefit of even if it's 10 minutes of day, of committed, quiet time. And I think of any single step a person could take, that, that is number one. I mean, so many folks, I felt it, you have had it in your life, David, you just get stuck, you feel lousy, you can't sleep, you're anxious, you're worried, your family's a mess. You know, there's, it's a complicated world. And yes. um, it, it sometimes seems like there's no options. You're just on this treadmill feeling miserable. So. I never felt when I was going through that, that I had time. I, I had no insight. Yeah. So I'm sympathetic with how difficult it is. However, it is imperative. You, if you wish to recover and heal and feel better, you, you have to give yourself and God some time. And that involves some time for listening, listening to God, listening to others, listening to your body. I love it. That's really good stuff. And I would add to that, yes, an alone time, some meditation with the Word of God and, and, and quiet time is super important. I would never argue that. Uh, but also, we need to extend that same practice into our rest, into our sleep, and give ourselves permission to let go of the troubles of the day and just put your head on the pillow and rest that you're safe Rest in the fact that you're safe and you're loved and you're a child of God. Uh, right. That will enhance sleep. And, and as you know, when we sleep well, when we sleep well um, it, our bodies work better. Right. And our mental emotional capacity is improved. Our memory is improved. And our physical vitality right. also is improved as well. Right. And, and I think that, you know, it all starts with that connectedness with God. That's where our ultimate source of peace is. Right. Well, you know, in my, uh, research and study as I was putting together serenity and health, I was so intrigued by all the research about meditation and mindfulness. And those were two wow. new things to me um, in a way. As, uh, and, it, you know, I was, wow, you think about that. So many religions, so many cultures over centuries have meditated and felt mm -hmm. benefit. Yeah. And I, I researched and learned a lot about the roots of meditation in Christianity and um, I also learned a lot about mindfulness. And I ended up, and, and there, there are really two keys, I think, to my own journey and I think could be hugely helpful to, to others. I ended up uh, with a committed practice of uh, meditation following the guidelines of something called centering prayer, uh, uh -huh. which is just a quiet meditation where you, you don't use words, you don't use thoughts, you just surrender it's in, in say, yes, I, I accept the presence and action of our God. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, just like the research said over time, not weeks and months over a few years, I, I, I know my crazy overactive in control brain slowed down a little bit. It became a little bit more open, uh, um, a little able to more be at peace and, and listen. And the second prayer practice is is related, and these these are two huge things that will help people find health. Uh, is a, a, this thing about mindfulness and um, you know trying to stay in the moment instead of being up in your head, so you know anguished about the past or worried about the future. I, I, I spent mm -hmm. all of my time up in my head and my to do lists, and uh, I mean I made myself crazy. Probably made other people crazy too, right? Well, that makes sense. I mean, you graduated <laughs> from medical school. You've got to have a type A personality, right? I mean, yep, that's the uh, way you're wired. Yeah. But uh, 
I, I realized I never I wasn't even listening to people. I was up in my head. And so I, I, I wanted to I read a book, I stumbled on a book. God sent me a book, which was called Sacrament of the Present Moment. And it was written in the eighteen hundreds. And it was about just grabbing onto the divine action of each holy special moment and just knowing you're in God's grace at that time if you are there in that moment with the Lord. Yeah. instead of being up in your head. And I took that and I, and just for myself, I developed this little practice, which I called God-centered mindfulness. And my goal was to say my little prayer, which was simply my Lord and my God, St. Thomas's words. Anytime I thought about God during the day or anytime I needed God, like if I was anxious, stressed, irritated, happy, grateful, whatever. And in, in the beginning, it was hard to remember to say it. But with concerted effort in six or eight weeks, this those words started just popping into my mind. And now, dozens and dozens of times a day, they interrupt sometimes negative thinking or anger or stress and brings me to the moment. And I just think, this is the most exciting prayer ever because it's a prayer I'm turning to God. It takes no time if you're busy mm -hmm. and it makes you mindful. And, and if you're getting stressed or you're about to say something you shouldn't say, you know, you put your, it pulls you back a little bit. You take a breath and start over. Yeah. So um, as I have spoken to people, I realize that this business of stress and anxiety and the head going is, it, it's a problem that many people that I share with many people. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I uh, I want a couple of thoughts on that, and one is the 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 quote that you used from, from the from the biblical passage, "My Lord, My God," that came from the doubting Thomas, right? That's what doubting Thomas came from. And he he's the disciples had seen the risen Jesus, but he hadn't, and he said, "I think you guys are nuts. I don't believe, and and until I can stick my finger through the hole in his hands, I'm not going to believe." And uh, the next time Jesus showed up, he says, "Hey Thomas, hey Tom, come on over here." <laughs> Hey, have a look. And he and he stuck his finger through the hole in his hand and he said, My Lord and my God. And and I think it's it's illustrative for us to say, wow, it took a lot to bring Thomas out of where he was in that that stress. Uh, and to just rest in the fact that Jesus was Lord. And I the same could be true with us. You know, we get caught up in the busyness of the day and just surrendering to his love and goodness is is a is a major, major hurdle that if we can get over, if we can just rest in that. Wow, what what peace it brings. You know, um when I was researching for my book, The Christian's Guide to Holistic Health. I, I came to the conclusion that there's, there's two things that we need to trust and believe in about God. And that is he loves us enough that when he tells us to do something, it's for our benefit. And when he tells us to avoid something, it's for our protection. We've got to hold on to that. And, and we, if we can surrender to his love and goodness and say, look, God, I know you have my well-being in mind. Wow. The peace that we can enjoy. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. You know, David, I wouldn't be doing this now if I hadn't had, you know, a crisis and you know, a pivotal moment in my life when I was close to 40, having to do with just absolute desperation and crisis in my marriage and just, you know, terrible concern that my daughters were being ruined because of the dysfunction and the shame and the anger. And, and you know, I had no insight. I could just blame everything on my husband, right? And yeah. I was too busy, busy to deal with it anyway. Uh huh. And it just got, and I had uh, not intentionally, but because I was too busy, I sort of abandoned my childhood faith by that time. Mm. So I was just floating free. And, uh, you know, that pain took me to my knees. It took me to God. And I hadn't, I didn't want to get a divorce. I didn't want to stay married. I didn't want my kids to be ruined. I didn't want any of the options that seemed to be on the table, you know? <laughs> and, um, it was the most awful time in my life, but it was the absolute best time in my life. And I know you've heard that kind of a story before, but I eventually just, I just had to turn to God and, and give up and surrender yeah. and listen. And um, I clearly felt called to stay married 
And I told my husband I would, you know, not return to the divorce lawyer. Yeah. And we did have uh, a relative return of peace to our family. I, I was by this time moving ahead on my adult journey as a follower of Jesus, which was the first time in my whole life, you know, as an adult, I was on this journey. But you know what happened? A few years later, he got leukemia and died. Mm. So it was like, wow. <laughs> and it was after that that I made I just continued on my own journey to try and figure out what this all meant and my spiritual journey. And I, that's when I changed specialties and I worked in um, Washington, D.C. with immigrants and homeless. And that's where I really got an education about what health is and, and, and how stress just devastates mm. health. If you have, don't know if you can pay your rent and you know, your husband's an alcoholic, whatever the circumstances were, yeah. you were abused as a kid, uh -huh. the discrimination, all, it, it, you know, you, you're going to have a wealth of health problems and misery, and that's what they had. And then, this is, what's, this is what really, really got me, to see how when they, those folks were in a situation where they, for the first time, had hope. It was like the magic ingredient. Mm. I, I mean, an immigrant who would have come to the clinic every week, a new immigrant, I'm thinking of a young woman, many, many problems, headache, stomachache, backache, insomnia, anxiety, depression. You know, a new immigrant living in her auntie's living room, no money, no friends, couldn't speak English. And, and then she stops coming to the clinic until she returns six months later, like a transformed person. And what, what healed her of all those ailments? She uh, started going to the um, charter school for um, immigrants for in to learn English. Uh -huh. and she made friends. She had a part-time job. She had hope. Yeah. She was cured. Uh -huh. And I, I saw that kind of thing repeatedly. And that, that was you know, all part of my learning. Yeah. I'm thinking of the, the Zig Ziglar teaching, uh, you know, one of the greatest motivational speakers that ever lived. Uh, Zig was a follower of Jesus Christ, and he, and he was asked a question at a seminar. And they said, hey, hey Zig, can, can we just think our way, can, uh, power, power of positive thinking, can we think our way into health and happiness? And he said, no, you can't, but it sure does help. Yeah, absolutely. Right? No, no, absolutely. But if you don't start with the thinking process and, you know, some quiet, some reflection, some time, some prayer, you, you, um, you may not be able to move ahead and have that hope or motivation or be able to take that first intentional step without which you're right. not going to make progress. Right. You know, you know, just to take that one step further, I would suggest that if, and you're an oncologist, um, and I want to, I want to be respectful of your, your position there, but, um, you know, if a doctor, sees a grim outlook and the prognosis is not good and says to their patient, you know, it's, it's time to go home and get your affairs in order. Uh, that can bring a, a, a real, it can just pull the rug out from under a person and, and leave them with no hope. Uh, I would suggest, and I've said this for many years, I said it in my book, uh, Christian's Guide to Holistic Health, and that is anyone that's gone on to defy that diet, that prognosis, and, and go on to beat cancer, has to have said in their minds at some point had a, had a, a, a like a a line in the sand and said you know what I'm not going to accept that I'm going to believe that I can beat this would you agree with that well it's complicated but but what I do agree with what you said is that the attitude of the patient has a huge amount to do with how much they suffer. Yes. And if you are optimistic and hopeful, you're you're better able to care for yourself. You have all those positive endorphins and things floating around. Mm -hmm. If you trust Jesus, I always talk about the the quote health benefits of trusting Jesus. Obviously, we don't have our faith and believe in God and trust Jesus so we can be more healthy. That that's that's ridiculous. That's right. However, however, I think Jesus is very, very happy to give us this bonus, this grace of feeling better when we trust him. And that includes people who have advanced cancer. Yeah. And I mean, I remember seeing folks and, and thinking even way back then uh, how 
easier it is to go through a, a, a terminal illness if if you are at peace versus if you are just desperate and angry that this has happened right. to you. And so it's an example of how, you know, I, we're not talking about a prosperity gospel. You do everything right, you're going to be healed. Right. But if you trust God and do the best you can, you, you will suffer less positively in my view. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with that. You, you and I are on the same page here. You know, um, God's in control. God is sovereign and in charge. And sometimes he will use suffering and sickness to to bring somebody to a, a, a place of more spiritual maturity. No doubt about that. Um, but if we if we worship him and love him the way we should, because he's worthy of our worship, that's the reason why we we surrender to him. Uh, the nice fringe benefit of that is the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Who would argue that though all of those qualities are not health promoting? They are. Right. Uh, so Absolutely. it's not name it and claim it. It's not saying, hey, if I do this, this has to happen. No, 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 that's not true. But why don't we just behave the way Jesus taught and, and act like true disciples and let the chips fall where they may on the outcome. Just trust in his wisdom and his guidance and enjoy some of those side effects. Right. But of course, the and you mentioned this earlier, the, the whole other side is that we can't just expect him to take care of us, that we've been given this gift of our bodies and our health and we we are stewards and i believe i believe it's part of our responsibility as christians to take care of that gift and take care of that body because then we can better do his holy will and um but it's not easy as we all know yeah. to have healthy habits and right. uh but but we have a lot of power over our health you know uh Something like seventy percent of chronic disease in our country right now could be cured or improved with uh, the adoption of healthy habits. Now, I find that staggering, yeah. <laughs> really. Um, and but I know how hard it is. It's not easy to to change habits right. when you. So uh, that's another part of this whole thing. And that's where like groups come in and communities, that's an advantage of church or faith groups or, uh, and there are plenty of churches and, and faith organizations that direct uh, their, their, their efforts yeah. toward health, trying to learn how to do that, how to set a tiny goal that's reachable and yeah. take a small step. I maybe you're, maybe you're only, the only change you're going to make is you're going to, walk for 15 minutes three times a week mm -hmm. okay that's great you do that yeah yeah i totally agree with that so let's talk about some of the specifics let's say someone's listening and they have a metabolic syndrome they're overweight maybe they're diabetic anxious depressed uh they're a follower of jesus christ and they feel stuck and they feel like uh yeah. this is my lot in life what would you say to that person and there's a lot of those people, David, uh, uh, or lesser degrees of. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is, like I said, to make sure you have a committed prayer time to listen to God. And, and everybody does it differently. I, I found tremendous benefit from meditative prayer in addition to what I use with the Bible. I'm a Catholic, so I go to Mass. Uh -huh. and. I, you know, learn a lot and grow closer to God a lot through that way. However, your faith, everybody has their own. But you, I, I believe no matter how lousy your life is, how crummy you feel, how busy you are, that you have to do that. And if you're already doing that, maybe it's time to reevaluate if you're not satisfied. Maybe you need a different prayer practice or a prayer partner or a Bible group or something. But um that's the first thing. Yeah. The the uh second thing is to figure out some to think about the what you can do for body, mind and spirit and, and just think about it. 
uh, I, Benjamin Franklin had this huge routine. Did you ever study what he did for self-improvement? He had this whole book and columns like an Excel chart of all the things he was going to do to improve himself. Well, we don't have to go to that extreme, uh-huh. but time to, to think about. <clears throat> so you're going to have your prayer time and then pick one other thing which bothers you the most, your, your weight, you don't exercise, you watch too much TV. So maybe it would be a, a very small commitment to do some exercise with a very limited goal. If you do nothing, like I said, something like three times a week, 15 minutes, it d- depends on where you're at, yeah. of course. And, and whatever goal you set, Sunday is a great day, the Sabbath, to sort of reevaluate in, in, your, in your prayer time where you're at with your care of body, mind, and spirit, where, where are you at? Is God pleased with what you're doing yeah. in, in terms of eating? Of course, that's always a challenge. And I'm not one that recommends specific diets, but I've been hugely impressed with how few f- fruits and vegetables people eat when they, if they really take the time to count how many servings a day. So I frequently start with that recommendation because I think many folks get through the day and they might have two or at the most three servings of fruit or vegetable. I mean, think about it. If you have toast and coffee or an egg or whatever for breakfast and you might have a sandwich for lunch, I mean, you're to dinner and you've had what? One tomato in your sandwich? So, so where did that where did that rule uh, that, come from that you have to have a bagel and coffee for breakfast? So who wrote that one? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I I think this is a real good place to start. And you're you're the nutritionist, but this is just some place where I will frequently ask people to start. How many servings a day? Count it up for a few days and see. Yeah. And I don't get too specific. You know, a handful of something or one piece of food or. I mean, the vegetables are, I think, the most important. Uh-huh. But anyway, and and set some modest goal. Uh, five or six servings is a very modest goal, but it's not easy to achieve. Right. So I think if anybody out there with who's stuck does something like these several things I mentioned, evaluate your, your prayer practices and modify or increase or change as needed, um, do something so that you can move your body mm-hmm. in some way yeah. and and that start addressing the food you eat. Are you eating um, what God intended us to eat? Yeah. Um, uh, what, you know, now some people will need professional help, right. coaching, um, talking, you know, joining a group. Yep. I don't think we're meant to be on this journey alone. Right. Part of my uh, serenity and health I do programs at my church. I give talks. Uh, we have a women's group called Caring for Body and Soul, and and we meet weekly. If anybody's Eastern time zone and wants to get up early, you know, let me know. We'd be happy okay. to have new members. We're very well. Small. You have to share that link with us and, uh, at the end of the episode. Yeah, yeah. and you know, I put, uh, in, I I wrote this whole, all of my life learnings. And how I uh, understood this and and summarized it in a, a book that I wrote last year, and and I'm really I'm really proud of that book because uh, people have told me uh, it helped them a lot because I really sort of I was very honest about m- my personal life and the, the, my painful journey uh-huh. and what I learned, but. I, it, so it's not just a memoir, though. I wanted to then turn that into what I learned and what I know can help yes. you. And that's what I put out well, there. Well, I'm so. sure there's a lot in the book, but I just I just want to kind of summarize uh, what, what you just said. And that is if someone's feeling stuck and they don't know where to turn, do some reflection, spend some time thinking uh, contemplatively and and ask yourself, well, what can I do better? You know, and start out small, start out with the baby steps. Maybe it's a short walk and you don't have to start off with a five mile run. Uh, how about five minutes? You know, start there. As long as you're moving in the right direction, small change over time will have massive uh, potential. Uh, and then again, you know, make some changes to your eating. You don't have to revolutionize what you're eating and drinking throughout the day in a week's time or a day, one day. 
uh, but start off small and move in the right direction. And you'll see, you will, you will see note and notice progress over time. Yep. You know what they say, you, to see a change, you got to make a change. That's right. That's right. That's the yeah. hard truth. <laughs> so I want to ask you, you wrote a blog post called the red dumpster and it got a lot of attention. Ah. So tell us what, what is the red dumpster? Well, the red dumpster was a real red dumpster that appeared uh, two blocks away from my house in front of someone's house after the elderly lady died. And my my friend and her neighbor was just so moved watching all of the old lady's stuff be dumped into the yeah. dumpster. And it just provoked such a discussion amongst us about our yeah. stuff and our connection to our stuff and our mortality uh -huh. and um, trying to think about those who we will live behind when we die. Are we going to leave them a mess? <laughs> <laughs> and it, w it was just um, designed to help us think through and, and accept our mortality dealing with end of life planning. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, I think, a, an act of great love and respect for anyone, for our family members, to take care of end-of-life planning well. And do it when you're well and healthy. It's, you know, not, it's not easy to talk about picking a funeral or do you want to be cremated when somebody's already yeah. sick. That's right. awful. That's it so is. hard. But it's not hard when you're yeah. well. I mean, it's a little hard, but it's, it's, it's easier, still much easier. Yes. Yes. And so it, that was sort of the drift of it. And, and also just thinking about our overconsumption and how much stuff we have and um, trying to encourage all of us to um, simplify our lives as best we can and share mm -hmm. our excess. I love it. You know, one of the verses that spoke to me uh, profoundly over the years is John 10, 10. I've come to I kind of they might have life and have it abundantly. And I asked myself, what is a what is the abundant life? You know, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, which is the uh, the yachting capital of the world. And we lived on a canal and my brothers and I, we had boats and we'd go out and we'd see these, you know, 90, 100 foot yachts and all this, you know, extreme decadent luxury. And it, the the motto with most of my friends was he who dies with the most toys wins. Right. <laughs> and and that's the environment I, I, I grew up in as a young man. And, uh, you know, it's easy to get, get swept up in all that. Uh, but then when I started meditating on John 10, 10, I said, wait a minute, you know, uh, you know, an expensive import in the driveway and a big boat, uh, you know, fancy car that is not abundant living. That's not at all what Jesus taught. In fact, he, he taught quite the opposite, uh, significance in life is found in the context of loving relationships. And that's the spiritual component to health, is our loving relationship with God, the loving relationship with one another, and the love relationship we have with ourselves. Our sense of self-worth and our self-love is an, a really important part of our overall health and wellness and our vitality. You know, it's not selfish to take mm -hmm. care of yourself. You know, on, on an airliner, they tell you, uh, in the event that we lose cabin pressure, put on your mask first before you assist the child. The reason is you are of no use to the child if you're unconscious, right? So the same could be said with our health. I mean, take care of yourself because it's the most loving thing you can do because then you'll have the energy and the vitality and the motivation and the clarity of mind to love others well. And the truth of the matter is the way we treat ourselves how well we love ourselves is tied to how well we will treat and love others. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the fact of the matter is the better we treat ourselves and the healthier we are, the more we can enjoy our boat. Right. If we happen to have one, nothing you wrong know? with it. All, all just don't worship wrong it. with it. It kept in perspective. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, you know, like the, the um, the guy who had in the Bible who had such abundant crops, he had to build a second barn. He was so mm -hmm. proud of himself, except of course right. that he died that night. And you know, so 
yeah, it, taking care of your health, our health in a way is a little selfish. Uh, I mean, that's the wrong word, but you know, we're the yeah. ones that benefit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when we do things God's way, we won't regret it. You know, we, there's, there's benefits and no. blessings attached no. to doing things God's way. Again, no guarantees. Uh, but you know what you put, you right. set yourself up for success. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, uh, you talk in your book about emotional health and how that's connected to living abundantly. Ah. So could you speak to that just a little bit? <clears throat> yes. I'm really glad you brought that up because it, it, it was a huge part of my journey for, um, years. I never wanted to think about uh, seeing a psychotherapist or anything like that. I was just too busy to think about things. But the, as my brain quieted, as I had a little more time and was developing serenity and health and reading a lot and learning a lot, I started having all these questions about why I was the way I was and why had I married so young, so quickly, and why had I not been able to communicate with my husband? And what was all that? What was uh -huh. going on? Right. And at the same time, I started writing my book, which started out as a pure self-help book, but then morphed into a memoir. And the second I tried to write a memoir, I realized I, I was a mess and I was confused. And you know what they writers always say? I didn't know this, but now I know this. They say that you it's only by writing that you learn what you want to write that you learn. And I, I, so that's what happened to me. I started writing my memoir and I, I was so confused. Mm -hmm. And then I spent a lot of time studying psychology and emotional health and saw a psychotherapist. And here's what I learned. Number one, I was so driven to work because of the way I was raised. Not in a bad way. I didn't have yeah. bad parents. I had uh -huh. imperfect parents. I had imperfect parents who loved yes. their three children. But my brothers and I, above all else, we learned to work. And I did not understand how driven I was for all those years. So it was like I had no choice. I didn't realize what a problem that was for my family to be working yeah. all the time. And maybe especially as a doctor, it was even harder because <clears throat> especially in those days, part-time was hard and, you know, you're getting all kinds of rewards for being the, the good doctor. And, but the bottom line was I was driven to work and I had no clue that that was going on. And the second thing that was very detrimental in my marriage was that I never learned how to communicate my wishes or needs uh. or desires. I was much more interested in mm. having peace. I thought that yeah. was peace. And maybe this is a little bit of screwed up Christianity. I don't <laughs> know what it was, but the, you know, I never learned. I, I, I should have said to this man who I married, honey, I don't think we should get engaged. I just met you six weeks ago, but I wow. got engaged. I couldn't say that. Even though I, I remember thinking this, this yeah. is kind of fast. You know, I was, I was just finishing. When that happened, uh, my after my sophomore year in college. So, you add those two behavioral traits that were just something I learned as a child. That's how, that's what worked as a child to keep me uh -huh. sane and happy, right? So when when you finally realize. That, that that that's an automatic pressure in you making you be like that, then you have to start thinking about then you become more mindful of it. So now I'm retired, right? Things should be but I can still see those traits um driving me. And and sometimes not to the good of me or others. So I think emotional health requires that we know who we are and try and understand how we are raised and our subconscious and so many things that drive our behavior. And, um, I'm all for, if you, if you can't figure it out yourself or you think you, if you're always mad at people or irritated or have family issues, 
uh, get some help yeah. to try and understand it. I mean, I'm sure, still a work in are. progress, but I know my I I know myself yeah. better, and I'm the thing is adding all this together, and I'm much more able to respond to a problem instead Excellent. of reacting. Oh, to I really problem. like that. Good stuff. You know, the Bible says yeah. that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And that's a profound statement there. And I believe that there's a lot of Christians out there that say, they look at that passage, they say, well, you know, I've moved out of the house. Uh, I'm financially independent. I, I don't rely on my parents for any, I don't ask them for money. And so I've left parents. Well, maybe not. Because as you just articulated, we have a lot of things that we grow up with in our homes, our, our, our siblings and our parents teach us lessons that we don't even know. And we consider though that behavior normal because that's all, we don't know any different. That's what we were raised in. And sometimes it takes some reflection as an adult to look back and say, wait a minute, is this emotional state or are these beliefs or these expectations serving me or are they harming me you know for instance mm -hmm. uh, in a home the the dad always took out the garbage so a young girl says oh if a husband loves his wife he'll always take out the garbage that's what my dad did but guess what your husband doesn't like to take out the garbage right so <laughs> No, no, that's a wonderful example. That's right. Marriage is that's complicated right. with all kinds of stuff like garbage and Christmas vacation and yeah. birthday cakes and uh, bedtime hours and yeah. air conditioning. <laughs> Absolutely. And then we, we bring these expectations into our relationships and uh, it creates stress so that we have to learn how to work through them. Uh, one last thing I'd like to say on this is, you know, uh, a seven or eight year old or even a 13 or 14 year old, their prefrontal cortex is not developed to a 25, 26, 27. So their ability to handle uh, traumatic events is compromised. And children often make some really bad conclusions about their place in the world and the meaning of certain events because they don't have the capacity to process mm -hmm. them. So it's, it's worth taking some time and revisiting some of those uh, traumatic events in your past with perhaps a professional and, and see if they can yes. guide you through, wait a minute, is that normal? And is that serving you? Right. The therapist that I saw used the word distorting. She said, you were a kid and your, your intake was distorted. What, you know, your interpretation was distorted, but right. that's what you remember. That's your reality. That's your truth. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. So you talk in your book about ACEs or adverse childhood events. So uh, uh, just speak a little bit about yes. that if you could. Oh, oh my gosh, David. When I worked in Washington, D.C., I worked in a medical recovery facility uh -huh. for homeless people. It's called Christ House. It was an amazing place. It was a residential facility for staff. Uh -huh. So I lived there. And both there and in the clinic, these people had gazillion diagnoses. Uh, and I, at the time, I had not heard of ACEs because uh. this was a while back. And I, I just couldn't imagine why some people should have six or eight diagnoses and all these problems and mental illness and obesity and, and uh, drug addiction and, and cancer and immune disease. Yeah. And like, oh, my goodness. Then a few years later, I learned about ACEs. So an ACE is an adverse childhood experience. And in about the 70s, I believe the first study, maybe 80s, was done. And basically, it's been learned that if a child experiences a trauma, whether it be abuse, neglect, it could be divorce, it could be food insecurity, witnessing violence, uh, yeah. traumas like that, uh, this is how the study was done. Um, the rest of their life, they will have a higher incidence of most health conditions, behavioral problems, uh, psychological problems, uh, things like obesity, drug addiction, jail time. Yeah. The list goes on. It, it's an astounding right. piece of information. And as this 
so then when I learned this, I go, oh, that's what was going on in Washington. Those people all probably had right. an A score High, of 10, yeah. which is the highest. And um, I have reflected on this a, a lot. And, and the thing is, let me point out, and this is hugely important for those listening. If you have a yes. high ACE, you're not doomed. There are m- many things you can do to heal. Just the kind of stuff that David and I talk about is how you heal yourself from ACEs. But just knowing it right. might make you feel better. Uh-huh. Like, you're not crazy. You're not, you know, right. there's an explanation. So and now you're not alone. You and the, uh, you're not alone. And And just... Knowing aces, it just helps. Like, like for example, if I know of a, a child who appears to be in a unfortunate family circumstance, or if I was a teacher or a church member, and you know, there's um, a big push now to have ace awareness, trauma awareness, so that we can reach out yeah. and help and prevent these problems. Because the studies show that. Even if one person offers love and constant support, doesn't even have to be huge, to a child going through some of these um, stresses in life, sometimes mm-hmm. that's enough to get them through. So learning about ACEs helps, you know, s- helps us deal with other people better, and it helps us heal ourselves, those who have ACEs. And I think it should help us be very, very merciful and understanding and less judgmental especially if you're in healthcare or where you're uh, intersecting with somebody that you think is like, oh, what's <laughs> wrong with this person there? You know, and to understand they, right. they didn't come from where you came from. Right. They may have come from hell and they they may be so far ahead of you in their spiritual development and emotional development. Yeah. They have come so far. I would like to add, that was like only that. really good stuff there, uh, uh, Donna. I want to add one thing and that is, Nobody gets through life and escapes this. We all have aces in our lives. Yes. And it's, it's, you know, yes. we need to acknowledge that. We need to say, okay, where are mine and how are they affecting me? And that, that will, that will go a long way towards building a more abundant life and, uh, and more health and vitality on all levels, spirit, mind, and body. Absolutely. Because I mean, I'm a perfect example of what you just said, Dave. I took my A score and it's really low. I mean, if you, by the standards Uh of that specific test, it's just a survey that anyone can take and you answer the questions and you get your score. And mine was really low, which would predict, um, you know, less problems. But I've explained to you some of the things I took from childhood from my yeah. loving but imperfect parents, we all right. we all have trauma. That's, right. that's, just, that's how we don't life get is. past Many, the age of uh, you know min- six to twelve months without experiencing something. Uh, right. yeah, I, you know, I would argue even in the womb there can be trauma. But uh, anyway, uh, so Donna, that was that was, you've shared some great. You dropped a lot of value bombs here. Uh, could you just kind of summarize for the natural nation and maybe give us some low hanging fruit that you think would be easy to implement for the, for the listening audience? Well, I I will. And I'm going to be repeating myself because it bears repeating. If you're in a mess and stuck and feel just crummy and unhappy, just sit down and reflect on it and start making a couple of tiny changes. First being, your prayer life, your quiet reflection time. Maybe it's going to be time in nature. Maybe you can combine your prayer time and walking in uh, nature. However you do it, commit to it, not for the rest of your life, for one day, for one week. And every week, reevaluate how you're doing. Think about the same thing about your movement, your activity. Are you, are how much time are you spending watching TV or on the screen? Can you cut back? Can you, make one tiny commitment for the first week. Maybe you're just going to have no time except you can do a half hour walk on Saturday. That's fine. That's perfect. That's wonderful. Yeah. And do that once a week. And um, I mentioned before about the, the fruits and vegetables as well, but above all, I think is the absolute requirement to, to tune in, tune into yourself, tune into God, tune in, start listening and, and not being in charge on the go planning, just step back and, and 
let God help you along. I love it. That's all really great stuff. So Donna, if someone wants to go deeper with you and they want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? I would love to hear from all of you. <laughs> <laughs> My website is Serenity and Health. That's three words, A-N-D, serenityandhealth.com. I, it's all volunteer. I send out a monthly blog on topics like this, and I'd love it if you subscribe to the blog. And especially, I would be really honored if you would check out my book. Uh, I put heart and soul in that book. Um, by the way, I just received three awards last month from the uh, Catholic Media Association for Best Book in Marriage and Family, Best uh, Self-Published Book, and Honorable Mention in Healing and Self-Help, and I was blown away. Congratulations. So, That's really thank great. You. Wow. Thank you. And your book is called Pilgrimage, the A book Doctor's called- Healing Journey. Yes, and it's described on the website. It's available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble. I'll make sure. Pilgrimage, a doctor's healing journey. And I will make sure to put a link in the show notes page for that. Great, great. Donna, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It was really a pleasure, and I'm really happy to have met you, David. Likewise. For more, go to the show notes page at davidsandstrom.com forward slash 94. There you can find an audio as well as a video version of the podcast. I also put links to all the resources that we mentioned, as well as a full downloadable transcript. If you're enjoying these conversations, I sure would appreciate you telling a friend about it. You know, faith-based conversations centered around health are difficult to find. And if you tell a friend about it, I believe they'll thank you for it because it really is uh, very useful information and a lot of people can benefit from it but they don't know that we exist. So the number one way someone finds a new podcast is a friend tells them about it. So I sure would appreciate you telling your friends about the show if you're enjoying it. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. I'll talk with you next week. Be blessed.